Good evening, and welcome to our discussion on building resiliency for climate change. Tonight's session is a second of a six meeting series on bay and coastal flooding and fire risk mitigation in our county. It's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Leagues of Women Voters of San Mateo County. I am Marie Baldessari, the president of the League of Women Voters of North and Central San Mateo County. And my co-host is Tracy Clark. She is the president of the League of Women Voters of South San Mateo County. This series is a meeting co-sponsored by One Shoreline, the San Mateo County Flood and Sea Level Rise Resiliency District. Uh, the League of Women Voters is well known as a nonpartisan organization whose mission is to help educate our communities on critical public issues. And to that end, the League is delighted to undertake for the first time a countywide community discussion series on the impacts of sea level rise and wildfires in order to plan our community's response. These discussions will focus specifically on geographical areas that have different potential effects and therefore different potential solutions. Tonight's forum will focus on the cities of San Mateo, Foster City, Belmont, San Carlos, and Redwood Shores. We hope to spur our neighbors to engage deeply in the topic and offer their thoughts on how we can best prepare ourselves. So with that, I'm delighted to hand the mic over to San Mateo City Council member, Diane Pappen for her comments. Diane. Thank you so much, Marie. And thank you to the League for your efforts to help get out the word about the important work that's being done by the Flood and Sea Level Rise Resiliency District, or Fizzler as we like to call it. Um, as an elected official, planning and building infrastructure is really some of the most challenging impactful and long-lasting work we do. I, I think infrastructure is as meaningful to our personal safety as police and fire. It's also complex and it's expensive. Um, in my own city, the city of San Mateo, I saw this firsthand. We had to create two separate assessment districts and the homes that are in those districts are paying for the construction of levees in order to get out of the flood zone and in order to be relieved from having to pay for expensive annual flood insurance. The countywide Fizzler district was established in January of 2020 for two major reasons. First and foremost, water knows no boundaries. As uh, San Mateo County has the distinction of being the most vulnerable county in the entire state of California when it comes to the perils of sea level rise, it seemed only fitting, if not imperative, that we create a district. Second, it's all about money. Most of the work required to protect against sea level rise is hugely expensive. It was clear that we needed to unite to qualify for funding from multiple sources. A city by city approach was not gonna allow us to effectively compete, especially for federal money that usually favors distributing dollars that will help not just one community, but several communities. Um, the governance of the district includes elected leaders from throughout San Mateo County. The board members are from regions. So we have the North, Central, South, the coast, um, and, uh, and at large seat and two members from the board of supervisors for a total of seven board members. And I'm pleased to represent the central part of our county. The projects that the new district is working on all involve multiple jurisdictions within the county and that they run along the Bay shoreline, the Pacific coastline, or our watersheds. And they represent some of the most pressing water-related climate threats that this county faces. Tonight, you will hear about some of the projects that are going on in the central region of Fizzler. And as you hear about this work, I hope that you will see the importance of the two major reasons for creating the district. Water knows no boundaries, and it will take lots of dollars to protect ourselves. So without further ado, it's my distinct honor to turn the program over to Fizzler's Executive Director, Mr. Len Matterman. All right, thank you so much, Diane. Um, and, uh, and thank you everybody for joining us today. I'm glad to be able to, uh, to discuss uh, the district, our work uh, in general terms, and then zero in on 
a couple places and then turn it over to some of our colleagues in San Mateo and Foster City to continue the conversation and then we'll answer questions. Um, so first off, I'm gonna share a screen and, um, and uh, begin a short presentation. Um, so hopefully you all can see the screen okay right now. Um, so here we are in the, in the uh, really the second in the series, but the first that focuses on a specific geographic area. And as was mentioned, San Mateo, Foster City, Redwood Shores, Belmont, and San Carlos is what we're looking at today. So first a bit about the district and the county. The county, uh, as was mentioned, has tremendous vulnerability. In fact, it's kind of the poster child for sea level rise vulnerability in California. In fact, the whole West Coast. It's the most vulnerable county in the state uh, to the first three feet of sea level rise in terms of not many significant uh, factors. Population, including underrepresented population, property value, number of homes, and number of contaminated sites. And in fact, it's only one of six counties in the country um, and the only one on the West Coast um, that, is, uh, that is, um, has this vulnerability for over 100,000 people um, during the first three feet of sea level rise. Of course, we have many other assets uh, that are vulnerable, including schools, hospitals, beaches, highways, uh, water treatment plants, etc. cetera. Um, so there was a great need recognized uh, within the last several years uh, for this county to, um, to work together and, uh, and address this issue. So the, the, the county has uh, historically had an agency that looks at flooding. Um, and so the first question was, is that agency uh, able to address the issue um, that we now find ourselves in with, with climate change? And, and it was not. It was determined that both for geographic and programmatic reasons um, that the former flood control district was not able to address kind of the transformative challenge that we have. It only really focused on 10% of the county and 10% of the Bay shoreline and none of the coast side, which of course has major issues regarding erosion um, and that will be made worse. Um, so we also realized as was mentioned, that cities, uh, a city by city approach to this problem um, cannot solve the issue. Um, and a regional approach, both for funding as well as in terms of technical uh, expertise and land rights and permits, uh, needed to be pursued. So the district began in January of last year. Um, I won't go over again. Our board of directors uh, includes county supervisors and city council members. All 20 cities, as well as the county itself, have committed to its startup's operational funding. Um, One Shoreline, which is what the district is also known as, and our uh, website is oneshoreline.org, um, takes a holistic view at three key issues, the threat, um, by incorporated sea level rise. And uh, our objective for projects is a sea level that's protection against a sea level that's 10 feet above today's high tide. A holistic view, a view of the objectives, um, not just looking at the threats, but also looking to turn our shoreline and waterways um, from liabilities into assets that are integrated into the community and valued by the community. Um, and utilizing green infrastructure is an important part of that. Um, and then finally, a holistic view of the geography. Uh, to achieve these objectives by working um, by, with multiple cities at the same time to do regional planning. So this is a snapshot of the county. Um, Highway 101 is, runs along the bay here. You see the, the symbol for Highway 101. The bay is on the right and the Pacific Ocean on the left. Um, these are uh, some of the major projects that we're working on uh, just in our first year. Um, some of them are at various stages. Of, uh, of planning design. And in fact, one of them is gonna be starting construction down by the uh, intersection of, of Menlo Park and, uh, and Redwood City, uh, starting construction uh, later this month. Um, but the other ones are in planning and design. And of course, for this meeting today, we're gonna to focus in on this part of the county and the cities that were mentioned previously and this part of the shoreline, as well as uh, the water that comes to the bay um, from, the, from the hills. The current FEMA map in this area, and FEMA, the FEMA maps are based on what they model as a 100-year event. And FEMA maps are important because it's, it uh, delineates where flood insurance is required um, if, uh, if a property owner holds a federally backed mortgage. So FEMA maps are important. They also show the areas of higher risk. 
Um, so the current FEMA map for this area, and you see again, Highway 101 cutting through the image, the areas in, in blue green represent the areas in the 100 year floodplain, the areas in light brown represent the 500 year floodplain, so they're not required to pay flood insurance. And we'll talk about these striped areas in just a second. Um, but these are areas that will be in the in the FEMA floodplain if levees are not constructed. So this image shows Foster City here and Redwood Shores here. Highway 101 cuts across the bottom of the screen and Highway 92 goes through the screen uh, towards Hayward um, up top. And so this is what the area looks like in terms of the map. Um, and this is what it looks like on the FEMA map. And so all of the areas that are striped uh, will be put into the FEMA flood zone if levees are not constructed. And I'm sure many of you are, are well aware that Foster City has engaged in a very large project uh, to protect Foster City and to prevent um, the, the uh, FEMA maps being redrawn to include Foster City. And we are now engaged at the very earliest stages on a project uh, to deal with this issue in Redwood Shores. And later, uh, shortly, we're, we're going to hear from the Foster City uh, project manager to talk about that project for a few minutes. So here's Redwood Shores. Um, in 2020, FEMA notified the cities that, um, that the levees must be raised and, and data gaps must be closed to remain outside of the FEMA flood maps. Um, but raising those levees only to satisfy FEMA is a very short-term fix. It really solves the problem of, for the FEMA insurance issue just until the next time the maps are redrawn. Um, and it also certainly does nothing for sea level rise. So to, to deal with that in the long term, which is the objective for our agency, One Shoreline, uh, against sea level rise, our objective is six feet above the FEMA 100-year flood elevation. And that's what we're going to be uh, aiming to design these new levees to. By the end of this month, Redwood City, along with One Shoreline and our partners, are going to be applying for the first grant um, to, uh, to begin this effort. The map on the right shows Redwood Shores here. The area in yellow is in San Carlos's jurisdiction. The area in purple is in Belmont's jurisdiction. Redwood City is all here. And this is county land, which is called the Harbor Industrial Area. There are assets, important assets in Redwood Shores, including the county airport and San Carlos Airport, and also Samtrans has a regional facility. So these are the agencies that would be partners on this project with us. Another project that we're involved with at One Shoreline involves the Belmont Creek watershed. This is the area of the watershed. Belmont Creek is the blue line that runs through it. Of course, it's in the city of Belmont, as well as uh, San Carlos has, includes the watershed. And here's a FEMA flood map near the Harbor Industrial Area um, on the bottom right. Twin Pines Park is in this image here, and then as it flows towards Redwood Shores in the bay. And Harbor Industrial Area does see flooding. And, uh, and so in 2019, the county, along with the cities of San Carlos and Belmont, completed a Belmont watershed, Belmont Creek watershed management plan to look at what can be done to address the flooding issue in the downstream areas towards Highway 101, but also address ecosystem and, and erosion issues uh, farther upstream. The first project of that is working in Twin Pines Park. This image in Twin Pines Park um, shows how lovely it is, but it also shows that it's eroding. Here you see exposed roots as well as up here higher on the bank. And, uh, and in those, those areas, you can see that the creek is eroding, that land in Twin Pines Park is being lost, and, uh, and we need to do naturally uh, treatments to, uh, to reduce the erosion and further deterioration of the creek there. This will also improve water quality downstream and have some small effect on the flooding issue. Um, so there's a project that's beginning. Um, it's really two adjacent projects. One is to do creek restoration throughout Twin Pines Park. That's what the blue dashed line represents. And then also build under the parking lots at Twin Pines Park, a, a stormwater basin that will collect uh, stormwater uh, when there are high flows in the creek. And it will, it will drain into the basin through this orange uh, long, uh, dashed line uh, into these blue shaded areas. And it will, be, it will be filtered down into the groundwater. And then excess water um, will, will re-enter the creek farther downstream. And, uh, and it will be done so in a way um, that reduces the likelihood of flooding downstream as well. So that's the Belmont Creek watershed. I also want to briefly mention a project funded by the state that one shoreline is leading to do uh, to install stream gauges 
uh, in streams throughout the county. Um, the one related to this area is in uh, on San Mateo Creek. And, and so what we do is we monitor the flow in the creek and, uh, and are able to give a bit of advance warning to communities downstream about when we expect overtopping to occur. Uh, in 2020, uh, gauges were installed in San Mateo Creek, as well as Colma Creek, San Bruno Creek, and the Atherton Channel, which are all flood prone creeks in our county. And then in 2021, we'll be initiating um, in other areas of the county emergency action plans with the state grant. So here we are on April 8th. This is the event uh, tonight. We have another event on April 29th uh, that's focused on areas south of, of here. Um, and that includes uh, southern part of Redwood City, um, in, let's say south of Seaport Boulevard, uh, and then Menlo Park in East Palo Alto. In June, we'll be focusing on wildfire countywide with our, with our partners uh, from the fire side of of, uh, of activity in the county. And then back in September, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll turn back to water and look at the North County along the Bay and then the coast side uh, in October. So I'm gonna turn it over now for um, more details on the efforts by the cities of San Mateo and Foster City to protect against flooding and sea level rise. And I'd like to um, in, ask Azalea Mitch, who's the public works director for the city of San Mateo um, to take it from here on their projects. Azalea. Great, good evening. Thank you, Len. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters, um, One Shoreline for hosting this forum. And as always, thank you to Diane Pappen who's been engaged in this effort for quite a long time. So with that, I will, let's see, share my screen. All right, well, thank you very much. To start off, um, a little bit about San Mateo. We have a population of 100, over 100,000 people representing a diverse community and 13% of the county's population. We are centrally located, uh, very easy for us to hop on 101 and 92. And we have a large operating budget around $200 million as well as a, a pretty healthy capital improvement budget of 53 this year. As with any city, we have many key assets. Our main mission is to provide a high quality of life for the city's residents. So we maintain and operate a big wastewater treatment plant with Foster City. Uh, many, many pump stations, sewer lines, streets, libraries, and uh, parking garages. So the public works department is very busy. Now we have a big challenge, as you all know, uh, Carbon dioxide has been building up. As of this year, I believe the, the uh, CO2 levels have been the highest they have been on record. And we are continuing to see warming temperatures and rising seas. While we think about rising sea levels, we also a new challenge is are the impacts to groundwater. So something that we have to consider as part of cities along the shoreline are the impacts of saltwater intrusion as well, not, not just rising uh, bay water. In 2018, the state gave us uh, the most updated guidance based on scientific findings. So we know that the levels will continue to rise and the likely scenario if our greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise as they have been, is expected to be around 3.4 feet. There are worst case scenarios, but the science is continuing to evolve. Now, what does that mean to our cities? Well, we are certainly uh, starting to see the impacts of inundation, which is permanent, as well as the impacts of exacerbated flooding. And that's the wet weather flooding that we see when we experience storms. So we have learned here in San Mateo that our strategy needs to be multifaceted it needs to be regional in nature, as Diane noted, um, and that it, is, it needs to be subject to reassessment as the science continues to evolve. Now, we are pretty fortunate in San Mateo to have an extensive levee system that expands for over three miles. We do have varying elevations, so each of the segments uh, are, aren't quite aligned, uh, they vary. And we do have two segments that do not have FEMA accreditation. So uh, as Len noted, FEMA accreditation, what does that mean? Um, 
When a levy is certified and accredited, it means that it is engineered to provide the protection from the 100 year flood. And that sets the base elevation. And associated with that, however, are also freeboard requirements. So at the elevation above that flood to the top of the levy is the freeboard. And what we are continuing to assess is not only as the FEMA maps will continue to change, um, that protection uh, that the levy system does provide us protection, not only for from flooding, but from sea level rise as we continue to maintain that freeboard. And I understand what Len said that, you know, it is not focused on sea level rise, but it is, it will be really important for us to continue to reassess the elevation of the, uh, of our levees as we continue to see uh, sea level rise. So what have we done? So as some of you know, the city of San Mateo embarked on a 10 year program to re rehabilitate the uh, wastewater system. So part of this billion dollar effort involves uh, expanding our critical facility and that is the wastewater treatment plant. So what we decided to do during the design phase, um, we realized that while this facility is protected by the levy system, that we needed a secondary level of protection. So we decided to take the 100 year flood, the base flood, and to look at that high, the likely risk scenario under the high emissions. Um, and we were able to incorporate, in addition to the seven and a half feet of the base flood elevation, we incorporated the 3.4 feet associated with that 66% likely range for year 2100. So we designed our facility um, to be at that elevation for the uh, design floor. So that means that if we have a problem with our levy system, our critical features of the treatment plant will be protected. And that means the electrical systems will be above, um, above that scenario. Our second project we've been busy this year is this North Shoreview flood improvement project. So this is an area in our city that is subject to uh, the special flood hazard area, which means it's vulnerable to the 100 year flood. Uh, we do have deficient levy segments that are not FEMA accredited. So last year we started improving those segments as well as upgrading two of our stormwater pump stations. This is a $24 million effort. Uh, it is funded through an assessment district. And uh, it, by the end of next year or the following year, once this, seg the, this project is completed, those homes, 1,600 homes will be able to have the protection and not be subject to uh, flood insurance requirements. So as Diane Pappen noted, um, water has no boundaries. And this is these maps were developed as part of the sea level rise uh, vulnerability assessment that the county undertook a few years ago. And you can map out the different scenarios. Uh, in San Mateo, as you can see, um, the areas in light blue and deep blue are the areas that are currently vulnerable. And, and that is where we're doing our current improvements. However, you will hear from Foster City in terms of their improvements that we really are one region and we need to continue to collaborate um, so that this interconnect, interconnected network is maintained and so that it addresses sea level rise challenges. So what is our strategy in San Mateo? We know that while our primary form of protection is our levy system, we know that we, um, we will begin to see the impacts of rising groundwater. Uh, as we evaluate our critical facilities, we will need to incorporate design features that add protection. We have currently embarked on an update of our general plan, and we will need to consider adaptation strategies um, as we update that document. We also know that energy efficiency is critical so that we, uh, we tackle the greenhouse gas emission challenge. So we're in the process of evaluating how we can convert our fleet to be green. And then at the wastewater treatment plant, we do have an opportunity to assess our energy, energy recovery. We do generate methane, it is an energy source. And so we do have an opportunity to convert that into electrical energy. And all in all, I think that, you know, our approach is we, um, this needs to be a regional effort. We need to continue to reassess uh, the science and to see how the levels will 
um, will increase over time. And the challenge, of course, will be for us to continue to reassess, um, to plan our projects, and to uh, find the funding so that our community can uh, remain protected. And with that, I will pass it on to Foster City. Thank you, Azalea. Uh, again, my name is Paul Nagengast. I'm the project manager for the uh, Foster City Levy Improvements Projects. What I'm gonna share is an actual uh, project that uh, we talked about and I've heard some conversations of the need to plan and um, what I will share with you. And those of you that do use the Bay Trail and perhaps you do have used portions in Foster City, the third phase of three phases finally closed the trail. So there are approximately six and a half miles of Bay Trail closed and that reflects where uh, the levee is gonna be, um, is being raised. Uh, I've heard one of our design engineers say, in order to raise a levee, you have to raise a levee. And with that, it, it is a, um, uh, it's simple in some ways, but complicated in a lot of when you're in a uh, large area, six over six miles, you affect literally uh, every member of the community. And so I will go with the slide and I'm, I'm gonna go over just uh, the overview of the slides I'm gonna present will be a background, a little bit of description of the project, some of the impacts, uh, whether it's the project or the community, uh, why it does matter. And then there's always, I'm gonna share with you various, uh, the websites that you can uh, go to Foster City about the levy project. There's questions and answers you can ask anytime. There's a quick uh, turnaround on any questions asked. We have public forum opportunities. We have another one coming April 21st. You could uh, hear about uh, the levy project. And every week on Thursday, we have Levy Live where you can call in and ask your own question. I talk to a person about the project. So if I go a, a brief background. So we've talked about, I've heard uh, about the FEMA, the FEMA maps. And uh, in Foster City's case in, in 2014, uh, FEMA uh, advised the city that uh, unless something was done with the levees, uh, the community would be placed in a, a flood zone. Flood insurance is expensive. I've heard uh, conversations about having to have flood insurance. That can be 2000 to $3,000 uh, a year. Um, so that's not something that communities take lightly. Uh, it affects, you know, the financial consequences are, are, are high. So the city wanted to uh, verify that FEMA was correct. In 2015, that's when uh, analysis was done to determine, yep, FEMA is correct. Uh, we need to do something. And, and that's when it was decided to, to do a, a planning study to determine what type of levees or how high should the levees um, be constructed. And that following then in 2016 is when the EIR uh, was uh, drafted. It was for review. Uh, through that was a combination of uh, a sheet pile, which some of you, if you've gone through Foster City, you'll see pieces of metal sticking out of the ground. Literally that's uh, the sheet pile, that's part of a sheet pile wall. There will also be reinforced concrete walls and earthen uh, fill law, walls as part of uh, the types of levy material around Foster City. We've heard about paying for something of this size. Foster City decided on its own to uh, pass a measure, and it's Measure P, and it authorized $9 million uh, worth of bond sales. And it was a uh, pretty amazing 81% approval. I mean, you don't hear uh, much of the communities approving to tax themselves, uh, let alone at 81% approval. So once uh, it was uh, decided that funds would be available, uh, the permitting process, the final plans and specifications uh, were uh, worked out. There are, I believe, seven different permitting agencies. The major one is the BCDC or the Bay Conservation Development Commission. And that's a very extensive uh, 
permit to, to do the project, especially since you're closing the, the Bay Trail, the wonderful amenity that obviously uh, for three years, uh, it's gonna be affected by uh, Foster City's project. So the project was advertised and awarded uh, in 2020, which, oh, by the way, we had a pandemic occurring during then too. So uh, good news, bad news, right? The, the uh, bids came in really well. Uh, it was $60 million uh, project. Um, project started in October of uh, 2020. Um, where he is, where the contractor is today, uh, they've just finished the final uh, closure of the trail and that's from the San Mateo Bridge to just uh, west of Mariner's Point to Anchor Road there at the San Mateo, City San Mateo boundary. And um, what I wanted to you know, reiterate that it's a project and it, it, it's a three-year project. And um, you, you know, knowing that there are various restrictions within that, not, not just in case you have a, a major event, say an El Nino event or something might affect during the, the winter time, there's also environmental considerations. Uh, Foster City has nesting rails that has to work in between uh, certain months where the contractor can, can literally cannot work while uh, environmentalist is conducting surveys to determine the nesting uh, habitat. Um, we also, we know schools have been closed uh, the past year, but uh, a lot of them are beginning, are gonna start opening this spring, uh, April 19th. Uh, a school's right adjacent to the, the project is opening and we know next fall schools will be in session. Uh, the community will start to be more active. Uh, we also know the vaccinations occurring, more of the public's gonna be out uh, moving about intermingling. So uh, it's just a lot of uh, things that weren't considered early on, but we're realizing as the project goes on, and especially a project the size that we have to consider. And, and above all, you're staying on time and, and try to be within your budget and you try to minimize those uh, impacts to the community. And uh, Foster City prides itself uh, as the first peninsula Bayshore city to uh, directly address the climate change and sea level rise. Hopefully uh, Foster City can be an inspiration to other uh, communities. Um, and, and we talked about um, the uh, FEMA flood elevations and what, uh, Foster City's project is showing that it's, uh, it meets, and, and, and granted, studies were gonna change, um, you know, a major ice shelf melts can change everything, but projected uh, this project meets 2050, it's 99% uh, meeting the 2050 sea level rise, and pretty confident it'll meet 2100. But again, um, you know, obviously that's a moving, dynamic with uh, what's happening uh, overall with the climate. Uh, just wanna share some impacts. You know, we're, we're all talking about, oh yeah, let's go raise the levy. It, it, it's, it's a lot that you have to be aware of and the community needs to be aware for it. You know, I can just tell you with uh, uh, the community in Foster City, we're addressing uh, the various traffic delays, noise and dust from, um, the project itself, again, it's six and a half miles uh, of project. And uh, the big, one of the biggest concerns has been the uh, interruption of some of the recreational uses because of the COVID. What's the one thing you could do during uh, the pandemic was go walk outside. Well, what happens when we do a levy project and raise a levy? You have to close the trail. So uh, it's been uh, an interesting, uh, process to work with the community to, to um, share some of the other parks that you have available to use, to, to explain to the community, go out, walk out other neighborhoods. So um, you'll find it's, uh, it takes the whole community to do a project of this size. It's not just the, the city staff or the uh, contractor to, to build this project, but it takes everyone uh, to complete a project of something of this you know, magnitude. And I've mentioned some phases and those are the you know, levy trail 
closures. Again, to those of you that have used the trail, you know it's been portions of it start closing in October uh, 2020. And I've just uh, uh, advised uh, the final piece of the phase three was just closed beginning of April. Good news, contractors a month ahead. So I, I, if you notice in the slide, it said May 2021, the contractors ahead of schedule. So it actually was uh, April of uh, 2021. And, and the important thing too, and BCDC realized this is, you know, when you do a project, you're impacting the Bay Trail, a wonderful resource and amenity in the community. And BCDC was very clear, you know, instead of trying to, um, piecemeal it, you know, referred to as ripping the whole Band-Aid off, close the whole thing down, work everything at once and, and minimize the, the amount of time that the trail is out as, as much as you can, but realizing if you tried to piecemeal it, it would take you twice as long and, and cost longer. So it's a, it's a balance. I'm not gonna tell you, you know, anything's right or anything's wrong, but you'll learn it's a balance how to, uh, you know, work with, you know, having an amenity open, but at the same time, making ensure your project is successful and uh, financially feasible. Because, uh, you know, as we say, we can do anything, but there's al always a cost associated with that. Again, why this project matters so much, and, and you can see a little bit in the background, there's a, a rendering, what uh, the new um, levy is gonna look like. It's uh, the sheet piles I've been referring to. You see the concrete cap. It's uh, in some areas, it can be seven feet higher than the existing uh, levee. For those of you familiar with uh, the area and other areas, it's only a couple of feet higher. Again, it all depends what the existing elevation is and how much higher the trail needed to go. Um, the levee is also more resistant to any earthquake. As we know Foster City is uh, built on fill and anything to uh, reduce liquefaction or, or reduce possibility something being damaged by liquefaction during an earthquake, which the, the sheet piles are intended to stay in place. And, and I should note the, uh, the new trail that's going in, uh, the existing one now can be very competitive between bicycles, runners, pedestrians, um, the new trail, that's going in as part of the BCDC permit will be 18 feet wide. So you have 12 foot of a paved uh, asphalt concrete surface, and you also have uh, decomposed granite or that DG rock uh, compacted on uh, four feet on the, it was four feet on the uh, bay side and, uh, and then two feet on the landward side. So you have a total of uh, 18 feet uh, of trail width on the new improved. Um, uh, Bay Trail. And just there's some uh, acts, you know, some things to go to or some uh, web pages or emails. Anybody's welcome to, to uh, check into Foster City, see what's happening, how the project's coming along. It's constantly being updated with new pictures. We have a timeline on there. We've had, again, several community uh, forums to advise. Uh, uh, not only Foster City, but any uh, interested individuals can uh, check in, see what's going on. You can ask questions. If you have questions, whether technical or in general, or just when will the you know, trail will open, you can either find under existing questions and answers, or perhaps you can find them under, uh, you can ask a, a new question and, and you will be responded uh, fairly quickly on that. So I wanted to, uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to share what uh, Foster uh, City is experiencing. It's, I, I hear a lot about the planning that's going on now. Well, Foster City uh, went and, and decided to, to embark upon it. Um, I'm sure we have, there are a lot of the, the residents can tell you how they feel about it. And I'm sure elected officials will be sharing their experiences and any of the uh, technical uh, individuals that have been involved in the project. Uh, concludes what uh, I was going to uh, share and um, I'd be happy, I think, turn it over to Diane. I think Diane uh, had to jump off to another oh, call. Okay, that's those elected officials, right? <laughs> She's a busy woman.
Uh, I'm Margie Gator from the League of Women Voters, and I'm the moderator for the um, for this event. And I'm going to ask the questions. And uh, Azalea, I think we'll start with you. Um, I have a question: Are we really designing for sea level rise of only 3.4 feet by 2100? Recent models suggest more like 10 to 20 feet rise by 20. 100 due to climate accelerators already baked in. Are we misdesigning here? Um, yikes, the, re, uh, the questioner says. And also uh, someone else asked, can you ex, uh, explain the free board again, please? Oh, sure, absolutely. So if we look at today, right now, it's not raining. We don't have a storm. Uh, we live in San Mateo, there's a levee system. So that, uh, that water level is at you know, mean sea level. So it's rather, rather low. Um, if we were to get the 100 year event, that level would increase in San Mateo by around seven feet. So that is your elevation, uh, your base flood elevation is seven feet above mean sea level. So what we did for our wastewater treatment project, we said, Let's take, even though it's protected um, by the levee system, let's look at the seven feet and then add the 2100 likely scenario of 3.4 feet. So we're looking at almost 11 feet of uh, protection. So, and yes, this is an evolving science. Our project took uh, many years to design and we actually updated the elevations when the 2018 guidance came out. And, uh, and that is our, our, you know, our biggest challenge. How, what can we design, what can we build and what can we fund? Hence uh, our, you know, our, uh, our need to reassess as time goes by. Thank you. And again, uh, explain what free board is. The free board is the distance between the elevation at the 100 year flood and the top of the levee. Great, thank you. Um, this is not uh, for anybody in specifically, so whoever wants to jump in, please feel free. This question is, can the flood, flood control infrastructure help during drought situations? Anybody have a comment on that? I would say um, certain types of flood control infrastructure can. Um, if we build one of the projects that I mentioned is a what's called a regional stormwater basin um, that's underground in Belmont Creek. And that's an example of flood control infrastructure um, that also has water quality benefits. Um, and, uh, and it also has benefits to our groundwater table. Um, so, so I think that there, there are options for that. Um, but in terms of uh, protecting against, let's say, the 100 year storm that Azalea mentioned, or protecting against a sea level that's several feet above we have today, um, the, 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 that, those types of infrastructure, I think, would be more uh, substantial than what, what could provide these alternative benefits. Great. Thank you. Anybody else to chip in on that one? Okay. Uh, here's another question. Along with sea level rise, has any assessment been done towards ground level rise or sinking, i.e. stability over future time? Earthquake shaking, for example, can cause coastal fill areas to sink, which would impact levee height. So has any assessment been done towards ground level rise, sinking, stability over future with respect to earthquake, et cetera? So I, I can say that we were re very happy to see that the County of San Mateo is, uh, did receive grant funding and they're working with the San Francisco Estuary Institute to assess uh, uh, shallow groundwater effects. So I know that we're anxiously waiting for, for that study. Great, thank you. Uh, another question are, is pen Peninsula cities are updating their housing requirements Many peninsula cities will have to plan for significant new housing in sea level rise impacted areas. Um, how can cities address potential flooding impacts of locating new housing in areas inundated by sea level rise in their general plans 
safety elements and other resiliency planning documents. Um, so they can demonstrate new housing won't be impacted by sea level rise flooding. Uh, can you discuss the specific policy language that cities can consider putting into their safety elements? Kind of a long question. I'll read it again. <laughs> the peninsula cities are updating housing elements to plan for you know, housing. And many of the cities have to plan for significant new housing in sea level rise impacted areas. How can the cities address potential flooding impacts of locating new housing in areas inundated by sea level rise in their general plan safety elements and other resiliency planning documents so that they can dem demonstrate new housing won't be impacted by sea level rise flooding? Well, what I would say is that the, um, the planning <clears throat> design and implementation of sea level rise at the earliest possible stages in regards to sh shoreline development, whether it's housing or otherwise, or, or private, commercial, and whatnot, um, is, is it's it's better to incorporate sea level rise at the earliest possible stage because that uh, maintains the options that you have to incorporate the development, housing and otherwise, uh, into the uh, flood protection infrastructure. So in addition, to maintaining options, it also reduces costs because then you don't have to go in later and uh, and put in infrastructure around a new development, let's say, um, that uh, you know otherwise isn't is ill prepared for that new infrastructure. So so there are there are things that the general plans can include to incorporate sea level rise. Um, they they need to, and um, and we're working with a couple cities. Um, that are developing either the general plan update or uh, a section of their city to be updated um, to include kind of a broader look at uh, specific areas of the cities um, and, and to incorporate sea level rise into those areas um, so that we don't get into a situation where one-off developments um, come before the city for a request for a permit or, or, or application for development um, and that they haven't taken into account anything but the footprint of their building um, because that is, is a recipe for having the city having to come in much later and address the water issues uh, that should have been addressed at this stage. So there is a lot that the city can do. And um, a good example of this is is north of this area of the county that, that we're talking about today. Um, but one of the seven main areas of focus of the general plan update for South San Francisco is sea level rise. And, uh, and the other, there are two other areas of focus that overlap uh, with our work. And so there definitely is room for the general plan uh, in all city, the general plan update in all cities to include this kind of activity. Great, thank you. Um, another question, Paul raised the issue of evolving science and the possibility of additional major ice shelves melting, as is surprisingly being evidenced. Given the levee associated problem of groundwater rise and rising risks with rising levee elevations, as we saw in New Orleans, what is the practical economic height limit for bay shore levees? And what is the range of years of protection that it might bring? I'd be glad to start. Um, you know, as I said, for us, the objective is six feet above the current 100 year, which is equal to, generally speaking, it's equal to 10 feet above today's high tide. So that's the objective that the district is pursuing on its levees, 10 feet above today's daily high tide. Um, you know, in terms of what year we'll see that, I don't think that really matters. I mean, I, I think a, fo a focus, and, and people talk about it all the time, and so, you know, we hear it all the time, but does it really matter if it's 2040 or 2060? Um, the issue is the water. People are concerned about getting flooded. They're not concerned about the exact date that's going to happen. They just don't want it to happen. Um, and so our focus is what is the water elevation? Um, and uh, and uh, we're also focused on reducing the uncertainty. And so if you build higher, you reduce uncertainty and worry about what's going to happen You know, 10 years from now if sea level rise projections uh, don't pan out to what the state guidance is or anybody else's guidance. 
So we pick a pretty aggressive number, 10 feet above today's high tide, and that's the objective that we're pursuing for the projects we're involved with. Thank you. Uh, Paul, this question is for you. When finished, will the Foster City levee be of uniform height along its full 6.5 mile length, or will it vary based on storm surge considerations? Thank you. Um, I can't tell you the exact. I, you know, I didn't uh, wasn't I didn't go through the design review exactly, but I can tell you if you're closer or near wave action, like say right under the San Mateo Bridge, you're right next to the bay. There will be some higher walls involved there, and and, and also due to some of the surrounding infrastructure related to Caltrans facilities and bridge. Suppose the closer to Highway uh, 101, where some of the, uh, the levees only really being raised two feet from the existing. I don't know the exact elevations, if it's the same elevation throughout the whole six miles, but I know there is more wave action. And I think that the person that asked the question exactly right, the closer you are to the, uh, uh, the bay itself, because I've seen pictures of the bay coming over on East Third Avenue uh, during some major uh, wind and, and storm events. So uh, he can ask the questions through our levy project if we want an exact number. I can, you know, we can get back to him on the height. But in general, the closer you are to the bay due to the wave action, you have uh, more considerations than if you were set back you know, several hundreds of yards away from the bay, which in some locations that, it, that is the case. But again, if you want exact numbers, you'll have to come to the, our, web, our website, ask that question. We can provide, you know, whether you're north or south of Foster City, what those elevation heights will be. Great, thank you. Uh, here's another question. San Mateo County has multiple parks and downtown renovation projects in various planning and design stations. For example, Central Park in San Mateo, Flood Park in Menlo Park, Redwood City Downtown Parking, Martin Luther King Park, Junior Park in East Palo Alto. All opportunities to incorporate regional flood and stormwater treatment projects. How much influence does the, uh, the regional district have on incorporating flood and stormwater on these local projects? Well, um, I would say a lot of these local projects are, are, are city projects. Um, and, and so, you know, there are, there are, there is a, there is an effort to move towards regional stormwater projects um, to satisfy the city requirements to um, to address the water quality of stormwater, and the idea is by by grouping efforts into regional projects, um, like some perhaps some of what was mentioned in the question, um, and there are others. Uh, by grouping them into regional projects, um, then the multiple cities can get the benefits of the stormwater, uh, the capture of stormwater for flood protection, but also uh, for the water quality benefits. Um, and there are requ expensive requirements to do that uh, that are getting more expensive. And so I think there is an opportunity for, for some of that. Um, and the, the, our district, the regional stormwater effort is not um, kind of a focus at the moment, although we are working with others in the county, including some of the cities on their projects. And if I could add to that, so yeah. uh, the municipalities in San Mateo County, so we do operate under one uh, regional stormwater permit. So there is, uh, there is definitely the interest there to collaborate and look at regional stormwater uh, capture and treatment for, to address the, the stormwater quality issue. And it's definitely uh, a more cost-effective way to meet our requirements. Great, thank you. Uh, another question, can someone address the groundwater impacts of sea level rise on infrastructure? Levees may keep out surface water, but will parking garages flood or utilities sit in saline groundwater even though communities may have improved the levees? Absolutely, um, that, is a, uh, that is a concern. Um, and so that it will be part of our assessment. Uh, you know, we do have stormwater pump stations, but 
it is one of those uh, other you know, challenges that we will begin to see rising groundwater and it will impact uh, our critical facilities and, and structures. So to be, you know, to be assessed. Thank you. Uh, Paul mentioned Foster City was the first Bayshore city to address sea level rise with a levee project. I thought San Mateo had recently increased levee heights and Azalea mentioned ongoing work in the north, but does San Mateo have another Foster City sized project ahead? And how about Burlingame? So in San Mateo, uh, no, we do not have a, another project. We are, it, we started construction on our levee segments last year and that project will be completed in, in, in the following year. But, like, uh, but we will continue to reassess given that maintaining FEMA accreditation, it will be critical for the city. I, I can mention, thank you, Azalea. I can mention something about um, Burlingame and other cities. Um, so first of all, we, the first uh, mile and a half of shoreline uh, in, around East Palo Alto um, it was uh, a, a levee was built, uh, completed in 2018. And that levy is to that same standard I mentioned before, uh, 10 feet above today's high tide. Um, it's not the completion of East Palo Alto. There's another project that's now in planning and design to, to go to extend beyond that first mile and a half uh, at the county line for East Palo Alto, uh, a levy of that same height. Um, so about, I would say about half of East Palo Alto's levy was, the construction was completed three years ago and the, and the other half is, con is continuing in design right now. In terms of Burlingame, um, we do have a project with the city of Burlingame uh, and the city of Millbrae just to the north and it will align and connect the levy along the Burlingame shoreline to Millbrae's and then to San Francisco Airport just to the north of there. San Francisco Airport uh, has, a, has a very large project on its shoreline um, and then, of course, Burlingame connects to San Mateo uh, on, on, at the south, southern end of that city. And so um, we'll be working as we develop the, the planning and design for Burlingame's uh, shoreline with that city. Um, we'll be working with San Mateo so that these projects are aligned and, and connected as well. Thank you. How important is it for wealthy, educated, at-risk county like ours to demonstrate reducing greenhouse gas emissions as an inspiration to community, regional communities and communities worldwide to reduce theirs as a mechanism and this as a mechanism to extend the useful life of levees. So how important is it for a county like ours to demonstrate reduction of greenhouse gases as inspiration for other communities to do the same to help extend the life of the levee? Well, I mean, all, all I can say on that, the, the, the Climate, dealing with climate change can really be thought of as offensive defense, right? And reducing greenhouse gases is, you could think of it as the offense and building levees to protect against sea level rise is kind of the defense. Um, on the defensive side is what we're working on and what I'm most familiar with. Um, San Mateo County is a leader and, and there is a role for counties like ours to be leaders. Um, our agency is the first countywide agency west of the Mississippi to address uh, the water effects of climate change specifically. Um, and so we're, we're excited and proud about that leadership role the county has taken. In terms of the county's leadership role on greenhouse gases, um, you know, that's not, that's not something that I think, um, I, I don't know, maybe Azalea or Paul have thoughts on that, but that's not something that we're, I'm qualified to talk about really. Sure, I mean, I, I can say that we, we have our climate action plan um, we, as I noted in our, in our presentation, we are working toward uh, transitioning from, from fossil fuels for our fleet to, uh, to a green option. We are looking at potential opportunities to reduce uh, or generate electricity at the, at the wastewater plant. So our approach is definitely multifaceted, you know, as, as also as planners, we, uh, we put a lot of focus on, um, development around transit oriented zones so that people have the, uh, the, uh, the opportunity to walk, to take the train, to bicycle. We just adopted two years ago, a bicycle master plan so that we're trying um, to really connect the city so that people feel less stressed while biking. And so that we get more people to, to choose uh, greener alternatives. 
So this is a very much a multifaceted approach. It touches upon urban planning, um, you know, uh, how we operate and maintain our critical facilities and, and what vision our council sets. But uh, it is a priority for us. And we're looking at both how, like Len said, how to invest so that our, our defense is good, but at the same time, what can we do now to, uh, to make the, uh, the lives of our re residents uh, to have that quali quality of life improved and so they can have better opportunities to have a smaller footprint. Thank you. Uh, another question is, uh, what about Redwood City, Redwood Shores, and San Carlos? Is the whole coastline going to be ready for at least 10 foot higher water, including levees, key infrastructures, and creeks? This is a resident of San Carlos who's wondering if he should move to San Mateo or Foster City. Well, I don't think we're housing consultants or, or real estate agents, but having said that, um, no, I don't think so. I don't think uh, people in, in San Carlos need to need to be worried about that. Um, the Redwood Shores project covers most of San Carlos's shoreline, um, but there is a section to the south of Redwood Shores that is also uh, north of approximately Maple Street on the uh, east side of Highway 101. There is a section there that's, that's not developed along the highway um, that is San Carlos uh, Bay shoreline. Um, so the Redwood Shores project uh, covers Redwood City um, and it covers San Carlos, as I mentioned, it covers uh, parts of Belmont. Um, and then Redwood City extends south of there, though. The area that I just mentioned, Maple Street, Seaport Boulevard, that, and then south to approximately Marsh Road is Redwood City uh, Bay shoreline. And there are other efforts that Redwood City is undertaking uh, with our district um, to, uh, to, to, to look at you know, what, what can be done there um, to address the vulnerabilities that they currently have, and how do we plan for, um, you know, new restoration in that area and new development in that area, such that uh, it is aligned and connected to efforts to the north at Redwood Shores and to the south uh, in Menlo Park. So there's a lot of lot of planning going on around that. Um, as uh, as as and and I just wanted to say in Menlo Park. And Redwood City, we are starting construction. I mentioned that briefly earlier on a project that reduces flooding along the shoreline to the um, five mobile home parks that are in Redwood City um, between Marsh Road and uh, Woodside Road. Right, and we're having another event to discuss the South, That's the right. South Bay, uh, South San Mateo Coast. So on June third, so we'll be able to tune into that to hear more details. Uh, April twenty nine. April, April 29th. 29th. Oh, yes. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, will any work be done on the lagoon that winds through San Mateo and Foster City by the Hillsdale overpass? Yes, our Marina Lagoon. Uh, well, if you are free May 19th, we will be presenting, uh, we will be having a study session with our council to present the uh, stormwater funding analysis. And part of that is driven by uh, by, you know, by the, the costs associated in dredging the lagoon. So a lot to think about, but yes, we'll be presenting that, the funding options to our council on May 19th. Great, thank you. Uh, as various levees around the bay are improved for sea level rise predictions, what does that do to the flood levels for communities, areas that haven't improved their levees yet? Is there a regional cumulative impact from improving levees on the flood heights in unprotected communities? Well, that could be, um, that could be. Um, it's a pretty small impact and, and that impact gets smaller as you, as you go farther out from the developed uh, levees, the, the, the increased height levees. Um, and certainly uh, California Environmental Quality Act requires projects to evaluate their impacts on adjacent areas. And that would include the impact of um, increasing the height of a levee in terms of what that would do to sending water or, or increasing the water height in other areas. So I would say that would be evaluated by all of these major projects. Um, it's not something that 
that certainly should should keep these projects from moving forward. Great, thank you. And I only have a couple of other questions in the Q and A. So if the audience has more, please uh, throw them up in the Q and A. Thank you, Margie. Could I correct myself? It's May seventeenth. I just realized for our okay. council meeting for the Marina Lagoon. Sorry, it was April 19th. 19th that's our next meeting, but May okay. 17th. Thank you. Great. Um, which county east of the Mississippi has a sea level rise district? I thought one shoreline was the only SLR flood control district in the USA. Thanks. Well, so there are, um, I, I, don't, I don't have a full record of, of all the shoreline counties east of the Mississippi and, and what they're doing, but I can say, that in, um, in, in Louisiana, there are parishes that since Katrina have developed uh, countywide or parish-wide programs um, that look at climate change resilience issues. Um, I, I can't say that they're, you know, the, what their model is relative to ours. And also, um, as, as people may have read, um, there's a lot of activity going on on a regional scale in um, Miami, uh, Dade County, Florida, and the counties to the north of there um to to address their vulnerabilities and then um and then you know new york and new jersey so there are several counties there that uh have programs specific to uh sea level rise and, and climate change um but in terms of county governance um you know we we the, what we can say with confidence is west of the mississippi we're the first that's all excellent well i think we would all like to say we want more be a good yes. thing yes, um Definitely. Uh, early on, when you mentioned uh, things that were impacted by sea level rise included contaminated sites. Uh, what contaminated sites are used uh, are in harm's way in our area? Well, there are actually many, and um, and maybe we could um, we could provide. So, so the San Mateo County completed in 2018 what it called a vulnerability assessment for sea level rise, and it identified contaminated sites as well as all kinds of valuable. Uh, valuable sites, um, hospitals and schools and the other things that I mentioned. And, and so an inventory of that um, is included in that document. And I'm going to, um, I have, there's a couple of our staff that are on this call, maybe they could, or on this meeting, maybe they could add a link to that in the chat. If folks are interested, um, they can take uh, a look at that report. Chat, maybe they can text it to you. The chat is disabled for the attendees. Got it. Okay. So we're doing so this Q&A we'll or they could put it in the Q&A and then I can put it out there. Okay, super. Thank you. Thank you. And the last question I have is beyond just building levees at an engineered design height, are there design elements incorporated to take opportunistic advantages to enhance recreation, water activity on creeks, drought tolerant parks with LED lights, green infrastructure, uh, and other social elements that would improve community access and use. And do you have specific examples? I do, but I, I, I'll first let Paul and Azalea if they want to say anything, and then I'll, I'll add. No. So oh, yeah, I, I, I can say that in San Mateo um, right now we have not we have not considered other elements uh, with our levy improvements. And I know Foster City has their hands full with a, a levy project, so I, I don't, I don't have anything to share with Foster City. So, so what I what I was going to add is not so much on the recreational piece, although as Paul said, you know these levies are are great uh, vehicles for recreation, and uh, and um, and I think Foster City's levies are going to be a, you know a great enhancement with their wide. Uh, levy tops in terms of uh, people moving about um, and utilizing the Bay Trail. Um, what I was going to say, though, is on the other other side of it, um, levees can be part of the uh, the ecosystem benefits that we have along the shoreline. And um, previously, I was involved in the construction of a levee that um, that had uh, on its on its bayside slope a very gradual slope um, and it's called a horizontal levee or an ecotone levee where you build different habitat zones on an extremely gradual slope and uh, that in fact is is better for the species as the seas rise you want the species to have these uh, kind of gradual habitat zones um, to to maintain the marshlands um, and also to protect the levee that's behind them and so there are things that we can do 
uh, and that we've built um, and things that we're planning on building um, that would include some of these ecosystem benefits uh, as part of the levy uh, infrastructure. And, and, and that way, utilizing kind of natural, as was mentioned in the question, um, kind of green infrastructure or nature-based solutions or whatever you want to call it, but have it as part of the levy infrastructure. Great, thank you. Uh, how does one shoreline determine what projects to participate in with other munici municipal entities and districts? Yeah, so we are new. Um, we were just started about 16 months ago. We have a small staff, uh, a couple project managers. We'll probably be adding one more soon. Um, there's myself and we have finance uh, manager. Um, but that's a great question. And there are a lot of needs out there. Um, and I would say there are a few things that, that we focus on. Um, one is we're looking for projects that have meaningful objectives um, and, and achievable outcomes. And, and so, you know, what is the objective of the project? Uh, is it something that will satisfy long-term resilience? That would be an important factor. Um, is there more than one jurisdiction involved? It doesn't have to be the case, but most, the, I think the, the greatest value added of the, of the district um, is when it involves multiple cities um, so that we can help to coordinate, to fund, and uh, address some of the technical issues associated with aligning and connecting your different jurisdictions. And then finally, is there a lot of local support for an effort? And is there a clear district role that we can value? Um, many of these projects are great projects that the cities have already or the county has in unincorporated areas. Um, but is there is there value added by having another agency that's regional to uh, to become involved in the project? If there is and there's lot of local support, as well as these other kind of technical and political um, so, you know, factors, then uh, it's, a, it's a good fit. And so an example is Redwood Shores actually, where Redwood Shores is, is, it may seem like it's mostly Redwood City and it is mostly Redwood City, but San Carlos has a big chunk of it. Belmont has part of it. There's a, there's a county airport, uh, Sam Trans bus terminal uh, or facility. Um, so it really is multi-jurisdictional and, uh, and the district is, is, a, is kind of a natural fit for bringing those entities together on a, on a broad, project like that. Uh, thank you. And I have one last question about Bay Marsh restoration. Can you address how Bay Marsh restoration efforts help protect the shoreline and prevent flooding? And where and when are we doing these types of efforts? Um, well, um, it can help to reduce flooding. Um, one of the things that I think Paul mentioned was the, the action of wind and waves on levees, and that has to be part of the calculation. And uh, marshes that front levees can, um, can absorb the, the water and the energy from the waves um, before they hit the levees. And so they actually can act to, uh, to reduce the need for levee maintenance um, over a long period of time. And of course, um, they absorb they absorb water. Uh, they also absorb carbon. Actually, marshes are, are great uh, are, um, areas to uh, sequester carbon. So there's multiple benefits of the marshes. Uh, a lot of the marsh work is being done right now off of East Palo Alto and Menlo Park. Um, and uh, there are former salt ponds there, in, in especially north of Highway 84 between the Dumbarton Bridge and Marsh Road, um, that are being transitioned uh, into managed ponds and then mark and then tidal marsh. Um, and uh, and in fact, the project that I mentioned before at the intersection of those two, the district project starting construction this month is uh, contributing to the creation of, of tidal wetlands there. Um, there's also opportunities around Redwood Shores, and we're just starting to understand that. Um, we're working with a, a research project that's out of UC Santa Cruz to take a look at the marshes around Redwood Shores and some other areas of the county um, to see what is the flood protection benefit of restoring those marshes, is, aside from the ecosystem benefits. That we recognize that, um, but just in terms of flood protection, what is that benefit? So there's a group uh, of researchers at UC Santa Cruz that's working with us to, uh, to identify that. So a lot of opportunities. Great, thank you. And uh, I have no more questions, but do Paul or Azalea or Len, do you have any final thoughts? Thank you very much. Thanks to the League of Women Voters for, for hosting it um, and Margie, especially for answers, handling the questions. Um, and uh, we, we appreciate the opportunity to, 
to get the word out and hopefully folks can uh, attend one of the future meetings. Yes, likewise, we'd like to thank you for joining and definitely for hosting this, this forum. And if you have any questions, please, you know, you can feel free to email. Thank you. I'm actually going to throw it to our uh, chapter president, Marie Baldessari, to close the evening. All right. Well, thank you, Margie. In closing, uh, please join me in thanking our speakers. The following representatives from the city of San Mateo, council member Diane Pappen and Azalea Mitch, who is the acting public works director. And we were pleased to have Paul Nagengast representing the Foster City of Levy project. Plus our special thanks to Lynn Matterman, CEO of One Shorelines, the San Mateo County Flood and Sea Level Rides Resiliency District. So I hope you'll be able to join us for the next forum on April 29th at 7 p.m. And it will fo focus on the impacts of climate change of Redwood City and that's south of Whipple, Menlo Park, as well as East Palo Alto. And if you'd like to uh, look at this tonight's presentation again or share it with others, you can view it in English and in Spanish on YouTube, plus, if any questions, you have more questions that come to mind after we say good night, uh, feel free to ask them. Uh, just send them to oneshoreline.org forward slash LWV dash forums, plural, and they'll answer your questions. So with that, thank you again and have a good evening. <laughs>